Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to moderate this very interesting session. I'd like to invite our panellists to come up and join the stage here. Um, we have been asked to shorten the session, but we do want to work quickly through it so that we can have an opportunity for some questions at the end. Let's cross our fingers that we can get there. So initially, I'd like to invite our guests. So please, Pakhari Darianto is the Secretary General of the Ministry of Forestry of Indonesia. Thank you, Pakhari Darianto. Uh, Ms. Shinta Kamandani, Kamdani, who is the President of the Indonesian Business Council for Sustainable Development, but also the Vice Chair of the Indonesia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Kadin. Ola S. Elvestun, the Head of Parliamentary Committee for Energy and Environment of Norway. Mr. Joko Supriano, the Director of Astra Agro Lestari. And last but not least, Crystal Davis, who is a Senior Manager for Global Forest Watch of the World Resources Institute. Please welcome our guests to the stage. So just to get, get us started, um, a big theme of the Forest Asia Summit is the landscape approach. And we're going to focus on that. And it's very interesting for me. Um, there's many people and stakeholders in the landscapes. And so it's beholden on us to be able to collaborate with each other. And that is the important topic of, of our session here today. Um, and for me, it's, it's important to understand that if we're going to solve the problems that exist in these various landscapes across the world, but particularly here in Southeast Asia, we need to be able to work together. And, and for that, we have to be able to collaborate with each other. And this is not easy or straightforward, given some of the history of conflict that exists between people when it comes to questions of land. We have a long history, I think, of conflict between communities and companies, uh, with NGOs, and also with governments. Yet, getting over this past, this past history, is going to be fundamental for us moving forward. And I think in the recent few years, we've seen some absolutely terrific examples of this, particularly here in Indonesia. We've seen Golden Agri Resources, the palm oil company, working closely with communities, NGOs, and the government of Indonesia. We've seen recently Asia Pulp and Paper, doing likewise, a long history of conflict with NGOs and, and, and communities, making new policy commitments to work with the stakeholders in their, in their business. We've recently seen Wilmar, and, and most excitingly, just last week, APP itself made a new announcement to go and talk about restoring a million hectares and conserving a million hectares of land through a multi-stakeholder approach. So indeed, I would say that this whole no deforestation push is something that started here in Indonesia. And given that Indonesia has long been a country when you come to these meetings, people talk about uh, climate change, the next thing they say is Indonesia, and the next thing they say is deforestation. I think this is absolutely terrific and exciting that, that Indonesia is a place where this strong push for no deforestation is coming. And I think that Indonesia can be very proud of that, and it's a very positive aspect that brand Indonesia is progressively delinking itself from this whole question of deforestation. And yet the future is not yet secured for our forests here in Indonesia or elsewhere. And there's much more to do before we can truly say that we've solved the problem of deforestation in the landscape. And key to this will be the collaboration between multiple stakeholders. And this session has been designed by, by the organisers to start drawing on the experience of our very uh, knowledgeable and experienced panel to share some of their experiences through their work on how they've resolved um, complex situations, complex challenges by working with multiple stakeholders. So we're going to get down to the uh, nitty gritty of the discussion. And for me, um, first I'm going to ask each panelist to, to start sharing their own experience. But central questions that I hope we can address during the panel is the challenges that they've each faced in their work with multiple stakeholders. What, are their, what challenges have they experienced to bring multiple stakeholders together? It's not always easy or straightforward, as I said, when there's a long history of conflict. But also, I would ask them to draw on what do they think the opportunities or, or what are the best collaborative approaches that they've seen or they've been involved in themselves to resolve these sustainability challenges. So these are the two questions we hope to draw out in the discussion. I'll come and join my panellists over here. Hopefully my microphone is working. 
And, and I'd like to invite Pakhari Darianto first, please, to share with us your experiences, uh, Pakhari, of, of a collaborative approach that uh, you've, you've had experience with. Thank you, Pak Scott. Uh, if we are talking about uh, multi-stakeholder processes, uh, in Indonesia, we have many experience. Uh, amongst other is about when we are setting a timber licensee arsenal system. It is a really take time to discuss, but I would like to share here how we finally have some legality timber standard in Indonesia through multi stakeholder process. First, uh, it began the dialogue on 2003, which the stakeholder government has the mandate, if we have a round table like this, and in front of the government is the businessman, who has the, uh, who to operate the mandate from legal, what we have. In the other set, we have a donor's country, and in other, in, in my left hand, as we can, civil society and NGOs. The role of the, the principle of the dialogue is a partnership, a word of partnership, partnership in 2003 is very famous, with uh, three principles that mutual, first is mutual recognize, reconnection, mutual respect, and mutual benefit. And the stakeholder processes, or the actor, I would like to say, have not be an individual, but as a representative of institution. Why? Because if individual come in the dialogue, we cannot uh, have some warranty what they are talking. <coughs> and the first dialogue, I will make it separately within government's institution, local people, business people. Why? If we make in the same room, they will blame each other. So for example, in the, in the depart, uh, in a government institutional, they will talking about, for example, people from Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, Mining, Home Affairs, they will talking about their system, their law, their regulation. It is not enough one or three times discussion. And for the businessmen, I'm not bring them in the room of officer, but I bring those people in the restaurant. Why? Because if they are talking in the restaurant, they will say about anything, positive or negative. They will blame the government people or the, but it is really, they can say what they do as business. And for the local people, I ask a local NGO with their mother, language. And finally, if they already agree amongst uh, the stake, then we bring in the same room, same room and discuss. In terms of legality timber with the uh, flag T criteria, we have to, dis to define the legality definition. And then it is also not easy. And then about the institutional who will give the licensee and the independence institutional will evaluate and accreditation. Then uh, uh, a dialogue in the, the big room, I just use uh, three criteria. First criteria, Everybody come in the room for discussion has their competency. Even they're just a government officer or local, but they have the competency. Second rule, they can do wrong. For what? If they say anything, is they right, wrong or right. So to say we need, you can do wrong. But the third principle, if we are agree, even it is ridiculous, we have to agree and they said to be agree. If they are not agree, make a dissenting opinion. And finally, we have uh, what we call in Indonesian language SPLK, Standard Verifikasi Legalitas Kayu, or Timber Legality Assurance System. It is a long discuss, but finally it is very appreci appreciated by 
donors country. It is very important for us, finally, about the key success of this uh, multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue is share learning from us, the government. We don't know about what is illegal logging, what is the capacity. Also, uh, from the point of view of democracy, the civil society now can uh, as a part of, uh, I would like to say, uh, the third power of policy development. And it is happened in Indonesia with uh, young democracy, but finally, when we are talking, when we are negotiating with EU, they recognize our, our, our result. I thank you. Thanks, Pak uh, Shinta, could you share with us some of your interesting experience? I'm sure you have many of complex situations. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. I, I would like to give a high, uh, my highest appreciation to Cypher for organizing this. Um, I think uh, I would like to perhaps share two examples, specific examples. First is, um, I think at, in the private sector element, I have to say that um, collaboration plays a very important role. Um, when we talk about sustainability in the private sector, the gap is also quite significant. So, the f one of the first important part is how we can uh, put private sector as one voice. Uh, when, when we say one voice is how we can put together all the different elements of the private sectors um, from the big companies to the me, um, uh, medium to the small uh, companies into one set. And I think that is perhaps one of the hardest challenges before we go outside to the different stakeholders. Um, interests are different and um, I think this is one element that needs to be, rec uh, that needs to be paid uh, strong attention in how we can listen to all the needs and interests of the different parties. Um, of course, the second stakeholder that's important for us is the government. And uh, from the early days, I think uh, our task to, to mobilize the private sectors on the issue on sustainability, uh, one area to identify is which elements of the government that we need to work with. And we start from the big picture of working with uh, Bapanas, for example, because we want this issue to be included in the master plan of the government. So um, we now have um, co collaborate and work with Bapanas in terms of putting in how the green economy is being put in the government roadmap. And I think this is a very big uh, first step before we go into all the detailed elements, it's how the green economy, how Indonesia see as a green economy. And I think uh, even that discussion itself um, comes from different perspective. And right now, when we talk about green economy in Indonesia, it's, it's more of Indonesia wants to be green, but how do we want to implement how do we want to become a green economy? I think that's the big question. So um, putting it, I think, in the, in the government uh, master plan is very, very important. So I think that's, that's the uh, first collaboration that we do with on a bigger picture. Now, I would like to, to, to share a little bit what we did from the last forest summit to this forest summit. Um, last year, when, when um, for the first time, the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry was involved in, um, in the forest summit organized by CIFOR, we realized there have to be specific um, target or objective that we would like to do as far as um, talking about sustainable forestry. And um, I think one, one area that uh, we, we want to facilitate, of course, is the low carbon use of um, option and red plus. And I think Red Plus has been a new paradigm um, that start being uh, pushed, obviously, as a program by the government. And um, I'm happy to say that at the moment, the government uh, has already its own um, uh, agency on Red Plus, and that really helps significantly. But um, what we did is, since last year, when we want to commit ourselves to put Red Plus as one of our priority projects, uh, program 
in the private sector in Kadin, um, we realize that uh, we need to then involve the multiple stakeholder in all this discussion and dialogue. And what are we? What is basically our role in terms of um, putting this um, in the right perspective? We find that um, there's um, a lot of lacking of existing models, few resources on social conflicts, um, barriers on HIV, HSS uh, management. Um, we have oversight in, in licensing, inefficiency, and many, many um, challenges that we face in terms of um, trying to put this forward. One of the biggest challenge, obviously, the financing of Red Plus. So when we now bring in private sectors into uh, doing more Red Plus project, we realize that we, they cannot scale up. There is no financing available in order for them to be able to do that. So um, watching um, of identifying some of these um, uh, challenges and opportunity, we realized that as, as Kadin, we need to play a bigger role in doing a specific actions or facilitating. And uh, we then bring the three elements of government, obviously business and, uh, and civil society into the picture. And we have been uh, organizing a series of dialogue um, interviews as a verification on some of the um, issues that is faced on the side. Now, what we come up with is uh, we ask ourselves, how can we add value on this specific issue? So um, we have come up with four areas at the moment as a result of this um, collaboration. One is um, establishing the social conflict resource unit at Kadin. We feel that we as an independent body may be able to play a bigger role in resolving some of the social conflict. The second is the facilitating some of the land swap because this is a, also a big issue. Um, one of the area that's important is uh, facilitating the one map development. And this is something that we're working at the moment with the Red Plus Agency because we believe without one map, it's very difficult for all the actors to play. Um, to play. Uh, the fourth is facilitating the best management practices for all uh, uh, palm smallholders. We have to start uh, paying attention to the smallholders. I mean, I think the big companies have the support and facilities, but not enough resources for the smallholders. So this is the four areas that we are collaborating. Um, Kadin is leading in facilitating in how this um, now that this can be implemented and executed. Thank you, Shinta. Ola, could you share with us your experience of uh, a complex process you guys have worked through with multi-stakeholders? Well, me being here from the Parliament of Norway, first of all, it shows that combating climate change is uh, something that demands uh, through cooperation between all countries in, uh, in the world. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the special minister from Peru in, to, in giving some optimism and confidence into the COP process, which is something that I really think the world needs, is more confidence and optimism when it comes to how, when it comes to how we can deal with and combat climate change. And of course, preserving forests is one major part in, uh, in that, uh, in that uh, work that we need to do. Uh, as a member of Norwegian Parliament, I think for us, first of all, we have to make a broad agreement at home uh, for us to be supporter of the Red Plus process. We just last year had a, an election. We had, a, we had a change in the majority in the country, but the commitments, commitment is still the same. Uh, when it comes to the cooperation that we have with Indonesia, uh, of course, this is a, it is Indonesia that mm. has to be the most important mm. partner. We can only be a supportive partner in the work that Indonesia or other countries for that matter do. So it's got to be a cooperation government to government and I would imagine that the, in Indonesia as in Norway it is a challenge to make the different parts of the government work together. As a Minister of, uh, of Environment you have to deal with the Minister of Finance, you have to deal with all the other parts within a government uh, structure and it's important that you have one goal and you have the whole the
different parts work together. This takes time. And as a parliamentarian, I will also emphasize the importance not only to deal with the, with the government, but also include all elected officials in the process, also the parliament. I would imagine that is also mm. something that is important also here in, in Indonesia. But apart from that, working together, it is not only uh, important to be on the national level, we have to deal with uh, the regional level and also the local political level so that we all can work together. Uh, and of course, as is was emphasized, we have, to, we have to bring in the business community. I mean, you have to, in, when we manage the forests, I think it was a good idea, with forest development goals, I think that is something that is necessary to work with uh, in the, into the future so that you can have something in common in different countries that we, will, that we can work with. But of course, when we, it, this is not about just, um, uh, it, this is not about preserving forests. What it is about is to have development at the same time as we manage and preserve the forest. So of course, to create the incentives for industry to be a partner mm -hmm. in that process is what is really, really important. And, and for Norway's part, what we can be a partner in, we, are, we have to work with the incentives, but you need to work with, uh, we have, you need research, we need to develop together the legal framework so that you get the right incentives for the business community, so that you get the right incentive for the local uh, communities to preserve and have an interest in in preserving the forest. So I think this is a, it's a huge undertaking. It's a huge task that the world in common has. And you need all the stakeholders from the local community all the way up to the national and international level to work together to make this uh, happen. And I think the most important is only to have a understanding that yes, it's a, it's a lot we have to do, but it's definitely possible. It can be done if we work uh, together, and the alternative is not acceptable. This is something that we have to make all together. Excellent. Thanks very much. Okay. So, Pak Joko, your experience is a private sector company here in Indonesia. What's your experience with working with NGOs, communities, governments, uh, to, to take your business operations forward? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Pinton. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, to CIFOL for inviting us to join in the uh, panel discussion. Uh, yes, uh, talking about the palm oil, is, uh, palm oil is everything for Indonesia, I think. Yeah, it's everything. In it. uh, Indonesia is the biggest producer, also exporter of the palm oil in the world. And, uh, this uh, value around uh, 20 billion dollar US per year. It is the biggest uh, non-oil export earning for Indonesia. It is very, very significant. And also don't forget this, uh, Indonesian palm oil is also about uh, 4.5 4 million uh, family. Uh, working and also uh, uh, be a farmer of the oil palm plantation. So uh, this industry is, uh, has a significant role for Indonesian economy. Uh, talking about the uh, climate change, I think uh, for palm oil industry, uh, what we are concerned is uh, how palm oil industry uh, do the sustainable practices. I think this is the only way how the palm oil is uh, participate or contrib contribute to the uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, as the biggest uh, producer of the palm oil, Indonesia, I think is now we are uh, on the way, we are on the way to, to achieve 
to reach the sustainability practices. Uh, why? Because uh, since uh, two years ago, I think, the government issued the regulation. Uh, it is the minister uh, decree, agricultural minister decree, call it Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil. It is uh, regulation which is mandatory for the uh, oil palm company that should be implemented in, a, in the, uh, 2014. Meaning it is the, the, the deadline of this implementation of the Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil is this year. Uh, why we uh, should uh, uh, support the government regulation with regard, with regard the Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil or ISPO? Because uh, ISPO is basically uh, an, um, an umbrella of the uh, many regulation with regard the sustainable practices. The, the issue that uh, uh, many times accused to the palm oil development is uh, deforestation, you know, deforestation. In Indonesia, uh, we have uh, uh, law of forestry, which is uh, uh, regulate uh, the land which is can be used for the palm oil and which land cannot be used for the palm oil. And the scene uh, three years ago also uh, Indonesian government imposed the uh, regulation with regard the postponement of the uh, new uh, permission of the palm oil development in primary forest and also in pit uh, land. With two uh, regulation and then uh, uh, in, the impl in the implementing of the ISPO, Indonesia, I think, is a, uh, in particular, uh, palm oil industry is moving forward to, to how to, to uh, achieve the sustainability practices. Because with this uh, two, uh, two, important, uh, two important regulation, uh, now, palm oil industry is concerned also how to we develop our palm oil in the in the uh, we call it in the in the marginal land on the degraded land and also how we avoid the peat soil in the new development so this is, i think is a is a good uh, move and again we are moving forward to to uh, achieve the implementation of the sustainability with regard to the ISPO. And uh, ISPO, I think ISPO is a government initiative. We have to support it. Uh, the ISPO also provide a collaborative uh, approach, collaborative uh, you know, uh, uh, cooperation between uh, some parties because in ISPO, many parties can join, can uh, give the uh, you know, uh, uh, proposal or give the feedback and something. So let's uh, go forward with the ISPO implementation in Indonesia. With this uh, regulation, I think we will, uh, we will achieve the palm oil sustainable development. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Pak Choka. Okay, Crystal, some, uh, are you working there? Uh, yes. I think you are, yeah, <laughs> good. Um, some experiences that you guys have worked with through, I mean, you bring a different perspective from, uh, you're, you're from a, well, I guess, Global Forest Watch, World Resources Institute as an NGO. And what, what perspective can you guys bring into this situation of working with businesses, working with governments to try and solve complex problems? Sure. Um, before I jump into my specific experiences, I actually want to share some of my thoughts about why multi-stakeholder collaborative approaches are so critical for resolving sustainability challenges at a landscape level. We've heard a lot yesterday and also in the speeches this morning 
that when you try to bring together social, environmental, and economic objectives at a landscape level, you often create trade-offs and conflict. And trying to find a single optimal land use solution, if not entirely unrealistic, is at least a very difficult starting point <coughs> for decision makers. So in the face of trade-offs, in the face of conflict, I would actually argue that the quality of the decision-making process becomes just as important as the actual decision itself. But at the same time, we've all learned that a good multi-stakeholder process, one that is inclusive, that's fairly negotiated, that's iterative and adaptive, that's based off of transparent and equal access information, is something that requires a lot of patience. Uh, there are no shortcuts, not at least that I've been able to identify. Uh, so I think it's very important for us to recognize this and commit to being willing to invest the time and the resources that a good process requires in everything that we do. Um, and now to, to speak a little bit to specific examples from my experience uh, on Global Forest Watch. For those of you who aren't familiar with Global Forest Watch, it's a new near real-time forest monitoring and deforestation alert system that was itself uh, a product of a multi-stakeholder effort. The World Resources Institute has built Global Forest Watch with the help of over 40 uh, partners from, and collaborators from the private sector, from civil society, from uh, government, who have brought together the cutting edge technology, science, and data that make it possible for the first time ever to be able to provide frequently updated uh, and transparent information about where deforestation is happening literally all around the world. Uh, and, but simply providing data is not our end objective. We see open data as a very important means to empowering and building trust between different stakeholders. Um, and to provide an, another example around that point in particular, when we launched Global Forest Watch in February of this year, including a new global tree cover loss data set that was developed by one of our partners, the University of Maryland, uh, there was initially some confusion and even uh, some criticism here in Indonesia about why our numbers weren't necessarily matching up with the official statistics on deforestation here in Indonesia. And I would actually like to frame this situation as an opportunity rather than just a problem. Um, when different stakeholders tend to come to the table with different values in terms of what the best scientific approach is and how you define terms like forest and deforestation, uh, but I actually think that there is a lot that can be learned through a very transparent process to compare different data sets and their underlying methodologies, to have an open dialogue about what you agree about and disagree about what those data sets are telling you, and then ultimately figuring out what these data sets are telling us about how forest landscapes in Indonesia need to be managed. And in fact, I think this is the same type of process that has underlied the uh, One Map initiative here in, in Indonesia, which is why I think it's been such a successful effort so far. So just, just to conclude, um, I think the main point I'm trying to make here today is that in, in the context of a landscape approach, I think it's just important to focus on the process as well as the outcomes. Um, and in particular, this process of trying to reconcile conflict can be an especially valuable one, um, but only when it is truly open and transparent and involving uh, multiple stakeholders. Excellent, thanks very much. Well, um, I'm mindful of the time, and we are really required to wrap this up in about the next 15 minutes, I think, given the session was a little bit shortened. So what I'm gonna do is just sort of go through some of the key points that the speakers have made. We asked initially when we started to talk about challenges and opportunities, um, and then to think about what the best approaches could be. And I think all of the speakers have touched on those points as they've gone through their, their presentations. So I'm going to just quickly go through some of those and, and then we'll open it up to the floor for some questions. So if everyone's got the microphones ready, we'll get some questions in a second. Um, right starting through the discussions, we heard this talk about mutual respect and mutual benefit. I think that came out very early. And I think um, one of the other uh, in interesting points that came out, this is about the best approaches, I think, uh, was a safe environment. Providing people with a safe environment in which to speak. Uh, Huddy spoke about taking the businesses to the restaurant. I think that's a yeah. great idea. Very you important. Know, give very people important. a place to where they feel comfortable to speak. And I think that, uh, that, that's very true. And uh, making sure that everyone in the room is competent and able to speak and, and, and lead. And I think that was, th these are great points. And, I always say one of my, I do a lot of uh, 
sort of discussion between conflicting parties myself. And I always say, it's amazing what you can achieve when you sit people down together. When people come together and actually have a chat, it's amazing what you can achieve. And I think uh, Puck Huddy made the point that he said, when we talk together, we can achieve many things. And I think that's very true. Um, Shinta started talking about the importance of being aligned, getting people aligned, um, making sure that the, the small, medium size, the large businesses are all aligned in what you've got to say. And I, I can understand very important when you're going into a dialogue that everyone's uh, in the, going in the same direction. And I think that's right. The other point was who to speak to. Who should you have a dialogue with? Which person and which government department? You know, you could spend some time talking to the wrong people and going up the wrong alley. And I think that was also an interesting point. Setting targets. Setting targets was important. And, and the f concept of a facilitating role. We've seen it many times that um, people sometimes get together and end up fighting each other even more. And actually having someone in the room who can facilitate the discussion can actually help it move forward. Certainly what we've seen in our work at the Forest Trust. Um, being inclusive, um, Ola spoke about a supportive role and I think that comes into this facilitation part. Um, being inclusive, trying to get everyone together, the different levels, the local, regional, national level, trying to bring in all of the communities. I think you, you, you talked a lot about the need to be inclusive and, and, and that came through a lot of your discussions. Um, and, 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 I, and I, I like the idea of uh, the research and thinking through the, the frameworks to bring people together. I like that. And ultimately, you said be positive, and I like that too. You can't go into these things expecting to fail. Um, you may not think go in expecting to reach your ultimate goal in five steps either, but um, I think being positive is absolutely critical. So that, those, these are great points. I think Puck Joko um, focused on the process with the ISPO and how that has developed and how this gives us a framework under which people can work together to achieve sustainability for the palm oil industry with the government in particular, a government-led process, which is quite interesting. Um, but with businesses following that and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and adhering to a process set up by the government, but with stakeholder consultation involved in it. So that was interesting too. And we, we, we we're all watching to see how the ISPO unfolds. And Crystal helped us finish off, I think, which, uh, which with, with I think is a very also a key point, is the decision-making process. The quality of the decision-making process and the quality of the conflict resolution process, giving people um, the opportunity and having the time and resources, the patience to let it unfold is absolutely critical. And um, a key point you mentioned, Crystal, I think, is trust. Trust, transparency and open dialogue. This also came out through all of the discussions. And I underlined here process and outcomes being as important as each other. I think the speakers have given us some great insight into their own experiences. And um, if we had longer, we could really go into some real details about their specific processes. But for me, those were the key points. Um, and so what I'd like to do now um, is open up to the floor for some questions to the panel. Um, please feel free to ask anyone a question. But I would ask, if you can, to really try and draw out some of these opportunities of these multi-stakeholder processes of bringing people together. Have we got a, any questions from the floor? Yes, please. Get a microphone there, here it comes. Uh, thank you, uh, my name is Zainuddin from Jepara. Uh, I am the vice president of the small scale furniture producer. And this is the first time for me to join in the Forest Summit uh, Asia. And thanks for C4 uh, inviting us uh, to be part of the Forest uh, Asia discussion. So uh, from the from, uh, presentation from the uh, speaker, I say about certification and uh, facilitation for the smallholder. So we are the smallholder now. And uh, I have a big question. Uh, about what is the benefit for the small holder uh, if we uh, are implementing the SVLK or uh, uh, care aware about the forest forestry? Because uh, you know that the, our position now at Chapara is uh, a small holder. Maybe I have a question to myself: What what uh, what food uh, we eat for tomorrow? But maybe you here you have a question: What what Type, what kind of food uh, of you will eat for tomorrow? Because we have a problem. Uh, even we have uh, implement now, we are, as the small scale furniture producer, we have uh, certified. But 
is thanks for, for the ministry because we have fund uh, so we can have a certified uh, SVLK. But the, the most uh, important thing, thing is uh, we must do the action. No, we have action. We do action to, uh, to implement, to, to access the certified uh, product. But what is your action? We are waiting your action to buy our certified. So we, you contribute to the uh, conservation of the forestry. And you know that uh, it will be a special treatment to Jepara people because uh, Jepara consume around one million uh, meter cube of wood and it's uh, the many people maybe around 5 million people is depend on the wooden industry. So I think uh, I wait your action to buy the certified product. Thank you. Thanks. So perhaps I think the key question there for me in terms of the, 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 the uh, session is what benefits do people get from being involved? And it's a question for smallholders and sure not just in the wood industry but in the palm oil industry as well. So we've, we've got little time but just rather than giving us the benefits of SVL car. Perhaps Puck Hadi and then Puck Joko can just share with us your thoughts about what is the benefit from being involved in a multi-stakeholder process? What, just concisely. Yes, yes. it's a good, a good question. The benefit is the smallholder furniture have the access market to the EU. And also as incentive that no local people in Java, especially the planet trees. And the government no do any intervention. No, no needs the letter of uh, legality if they come from the plantation in their homeland. As you saw now, in Indonesia, especially in Java, the forest is increased fan, uh, fantastic. Then it is what we know, of course, the question, how about the market? It is a good question to the European countries. Please buy it. But of course we know, no in the recession economy. To do so, we do together with some uh, of friend of, uh, let's say, EU and UK, no profit some with the state budget, profit some budget for facilitating or certified of the, 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 the small to have this certification. It is the answer. So I think that what you're saying is, uh, just setting up the SVLK, setting up the certification mm. is, is maybe not the final result. You've got to go further and talk to more stakeholders, talk to the EU, bring those guys involved. So these processes never end, I think, is perhaps what the conclusion is. You've got to keep working on making these processes work. Um, that there's never any end goal in the whole process. You've got to keep talking. But Joker, we'll just pause for a second because I'm mindful that we've got about five minutes. Have we got another question that we can bring from the floor, particularly about the process of um, working through difficult situations. There's one way up the back there. There you go. Yes. Yep. Thank you. My name is Susanna Kroger from Greenpeace and I have a question for the gentleman from Astro Agolestari. Uh, in your answer about collaborative approaches, you um, expanded on ISPO. Well, that's um, a system to meet legal compliance. So my question to you is how do you perceive the other initiatives from other key palm oil producers who are engaging in collaborative approaches with NGOs and other stakeholders to implement and meet now deforestation commitments? Yes. Uh, uh, again, uh, ISPO is a government initiative, but uh, develop, in the development of the ISPO, uh, all parties is involved. It is government itself and then uh, private company, uh, smallholder and also NGO. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I'm not sure which NGO that is involved or include in the process. Uh, this 
kind of uh, process is basically uh, continuing. Uh, and again, the, the process of the esport development is now is just in the first step. Uh, uh, you know, we basically the, our target is uh, to develop uh, in the entire of the uh, palm oil supply chain. But uh, unfortunately, uh, currently is uh, just the first step, uh, which uh, the principle and criteria is uh, applied for the company. We are now developing for the other uh, criteria for the smallholder. Uh, this. Uh, kind of the principal criteria in uh, in uh, ISPO, uh, as, as I mentioned before, that there's all regulation in Indonesia because uh, the ISPO is basically regulation based. So all the regulation uh, applied in Indonesia now we put in the ISPO together, like uh, uh, just also just. Uh, uh, I said, said before that is like uh, moratorium regulation is also one of the uh, reference of the ISPO criteria. So with this uh, criteria, meaning that this palm oil company cannot uh, get the new permit uh, in the land which is uh, uh, in the form of the primary forest, you you never you never uh, uh, got the permission from the primary forest. Also, you never got the permit from the pit soil. So, uh, the important thing is uh, how the law enforcement or how to strengthening the implementation of ISPO. And, and it's also uh, the law, law enforcement of the uh, implementation of ISPO because with the strong implementation, uh, including of course the law enforcement, is I think is uh, uh, the the violation of the legal principle. In particular, we regard the deforestation and also uh, peat is I think is uh, can be done through strong implementation. So uh, initiative, yes, but I think the most important thing is how we, we support and uh, strong implementation is needed for all parties. Thank you. Wonderful. I think we've got time for one quick question and let's not make it about ISPO. Has anyone got another question there about uh, process? Oh, there's one down the front there. Thank you. Just down the front here, please, for a microphone. Here it comes. Yep. yep. Here. here, here, down the front. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Front, yeah. We have to be quick. Everyone's waiting for a cup of coffee. Thank you. The Suchitra Jantukun for Department of National Park and Wildlife Conservation, Thailand. As I heard from the Minister of the Peru and the Minister of Norway mentioned about forest development goal is very innovative area, innovative idea. I would like to know where your perspective of the Minister of Norway, how the key process to achieve this goal and do you think how, how long it takes you expected? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You've got two seconds. I don't know if I can answer that. <laughs> They say the first development goals. I think it's a, it's a good idea, and I think it's uh, from, as the minister from Peru said it. I think it's when when you we need to energize the COP process. I mean, there's so many, there's been so many negative views and negative news when it comes to the achievements have been made. But when we now go to Peru and we get to back into in Paris, we need to get that final national international agreement. Whether it is strong enough or not, you need an international agreement. And I think forestry has to be one central part of this. And as we work with the sustainable development goals, as you have the, the thousand year goals and millennial goals, they have had an impact. Sustainable development goals will also be able to have an income impact. I think it's right that we work from the bottom up 
more than you just have to... Uh, we cannot expect that one major international agreement is enough. Everyone has to do their part. You have to work from the bottom up. And if you have some common criteria, also within forestry, that is something that will help uh, also with the collaboration and the cooperation, countries in between, and also that we talk about the same thing in different countries, that you talk about the same thing, have the same goals on different levels also of uh, government. So I think it's, a, it's one part that is a, something that I liked and it's something that I will bring with me to Norway, it's something that we can work with in more in detail. Thank you very much. And we'll bring the, end, the session to an end uh, so that we can get out and have a cup of coffee. But I really would just highlight those positive points that we, each of the speakers raised about their processes. I think we've had a very um, interesting dialogue around some of the things that are absolutely fundamental to working together with people. And I would reiterate, I'd finish on a, on a note of great hope, as I said at the start, that brand Indonesia is, who would have thought that Indonesia would have been leading the way on these collaborative pro approaches? Um, and, and Asia more broadly, I think, but certainly within, within Asia, Indonesia is leading the way on these collaborative approaches to solving very, very complex problems through the partnerships of companies, civil society, communities and government at all levels. And, and I, I hope that the Indonesian experience can be shared and obviously with, uh, with the, the role that Norway is playing broadly in the global effort to, on deforestation. Um, it's great to have you here too. Um, global Forest Watch, our eyes now on the forest, which is very valuable. Uh, all of these processes are going to help us. So I, 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 I conclude with great hope that uh, the experiences that we're learning here in Indonesia around collaborating together with other governments, with all sections of society, are very positive and leave us with great hope for the forest. So enjoy your coffee and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>